Hey, it's Mark Podolsky of The Land Geek with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Art of Passive Income podcast, I'm really excited to talk to Brian Davis, who is a passive investor with an interest in over 3,000 units. He's the co-founder of sparkrental.com and just has an incredible philosophy on life. He is an expat. We're going to learn all about that. And we're going to learn all about passive investing Brian, welcome. Mark, thank you so much for having me. Pleasure yeah, to be here. It's great to see you. So let's talk about lifestyle design. It's one of my my favorite subjects. When when I Mine say too. lifestyle design, what does that make you think of? So to me, lifestyle design is just about intentionality. It's about bringing intentionality and and that that intentional design component to every single part of your life, you know, from your personal life and your family life to your social life, your, obviously your, your career and professional life, your finances, right? Your personal finances and really building this from the ground up from a place of what does my ideal lifestyle and ideal life look like? Uh, you know, what's, what do I want to be doing at 1137 on a Tuesday morning? You know, um, yeah, so some people, some people don't like that term lifestyle design. You know, they might find it pretentious. I love it. I, I think that there is nothing more important than getting super intentional about every component of your life. Because if you don't, then the river of life is just going to float you downstream, right? And you will be at the at the whims of of that river. So uh, yeah, that's lifestyle design in a nutshell to me. Yeah, it's so funny because. I think we're the only species that has this 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 crisis of what do I do with my life, right? Like like all the animals that are just instinctual, they do their thing. They don't have this problem, but human beings, if we don't design it ourselves, we don't figure out our purpose every day, then we're sort of left to the whims of of life, and life's going to kick us around a little bit until we we figure this out, and so. It's to have a take an active approach to your to how you want to live is I think is way better than taking this sort of laissez faire approach. So let, let's talk a little bit about your idea of of freedom. You I know you have a concept of the four freedoms. Let's talk about that. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it's it's something that I've been kind of kicking around recently uh, and just exploring in my own life and in my own writing. I do some freelance writing for other personal finance and real estate blogs as well. So when I, this concept of the four freedoms is that if you have these four freedoms, then you can do anything you want with your life. So one time freedom, being able to set your own hours as you work. Uh, you know, a lot of us are more familiar than that than we were before uh, post pandemic. Same thing with the second freedom of location freedom, being able to work from anywhere in the world. Uh, again, that's something that was less common five years ago, but post pandemic, a lot more people, uh, you know, if they don't have it, at least they're familiar with it and it makes sense to them. So time freedom, location freedom, uh, work freedom is the ability to do the work that appeals to you most, the work that you find most fulfilling. A lot of people get into this golden handcuff trap where, you know, they're, they're making pretty good money or you know, solid money doing a job that stresses them out uh, or, and maybe, you know, maybe puts them to work, you know, 45, 55, 65 hours a week uh, that they'd rather not be doing, um, yeah. you know, and for a lot of people, it's not even work that they hate or dislike. It's just not the work that they were put on this earth to do. If that makes sense, you know, it's, it's not their calling. It's not their dream work. Uh, it's not super fulf fulfilling for them or maybe super challenging for them. And then the fourth component here is financial freedom, which you can look at from two lenses. One is sort of the more traditional like financial independence uh, definition where you know you can cover your living expenses with passive income from investments. And obviously that's the ultimate goal, but you don't have to be financially independent to have mostly financial freedom from things like stress, you know, freedom to be able to go work your ideal job. And the way that we couch this, the way that we talk about this at Spark Rental is that you don't need to be financially independent to live the lifestyle that you would be living if you were financially independent. And I'll, I'll, I'll back up a second to explain how that works. 
every person who I've interviewed who has reached financial independence, they've all gone back to work. And it's probably over 100 people at this point <laughs> that, I've, that I've interviewed uh, yeah. who have retired early, reached financial independence, you know, whether through real estate or other investments, maybe selling a business, whatever it is. They all went back to work because there's only so long you can sit on a beach sipping pina coladas, right? If, if you retire in your 30s, your 40s, your early 50s, you're just you're not going to sit around on the couch watching TV for the rest of your life. That's a that's a boring and meaningless existence. So you know that notion from the fire movement of oh I'm just going to sit on a beach for the rest of my life and sip my ties. That's a fantasy. And it's if that's what kicks you into gear in the beginning and kind of introduces you to some of these concepts behind the fire movement, the, the more hands-on kind of stuff that is useful, uh, then that's fine. But the reality is you're going right. to go back and, to and, work. and fire means financial ind- financially independent retire early. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to I didn't mean yeah. to throw around these acronyms that people might not be familiar with. But anyway, everyone goes back to work, but they do it on their own terms. They do, they go back to work doing things that light them up, that make them really excited to get out of bed in the morning. So what that means is you can skip all of the heartache and all of the trouble of the super high savings rate and, you know, the slaving away and working the crazy hours and, and, you know, having a difficult lifestyle. You can skip all of that if you can just cover the shortfall between what your ideal work pays and what you want to spend every year. So just to give you an example with real numbers, let's say that you want a lifestyle that costs $70,000 a year and your dream work only pays $60,000 a year, you have a $10,000 a year gap that you need to cover with passive income from investments. You don't need $70,000 in passive income, which is way harder to achieve, right? I mean, that that's going to take years, probably decades to achieve. But $10,000 a year in passive income, you could, you could do that in one, two, three years potentially, uh, especially if you invest in high return investments like land and real estate syndications uh, right. as as you and I both know so that is that ties this all together of you know bringing together the the work freedom and the financial freedom we all want to do work that lights us up that is our purpose our calling here on this planet um, and you don't need to be financially independent in order to do that. You just need to cover any shortfall. And maybe there isn't even a shortfall. Or maybe there's a little bit of a shortfall and you can just budget a little tighter and quit your day job today and go do your calling right now. So, all right, I'm off my high horse. No, <laughs> I, I, I love all this. You know, it's, you know, what's the advice to the person? They're really good at what they do. They make a great income, but they don't enjoy it. It doesn't light them up. And is like that, like that's like the worst type of golden handcuff. It's like it society's telling you you're wanted, you're getting all this adulation, people are lining up to work with you. And now you're saying, I'm getting paid really well. And then you've got to say, oh, wait, but this really doesn't light me up. What's what's, what's your advice? Well, it, it just comes down to priorities, right? I mean, right. you know, if if your priority is the adulation and you know having people praise you constantly and and you know maybe you speak at conferences or maybe you get quoted by the press all the time as an expert in your field maybe you make great money and if all of that stuff is your priority if that's your your goal then that's fine there's nothing wrong with that i mean you know it, we all have different priorities but this is what lifestyle design and intentionality is about, right? Is, is getting really clear and intentional about your priorities so that you can say, well, my priority is actually being able to work you know, 30 hours a week and spend more time with my family and make money from anywhere and travel the world with them. Uh, or maybe you like the, the high paycheck and all the glory, and that's okay if that is your priority, but you need to make a firm and intentional decision about that priority. Yeah. What about the price that people have to pay for this intentionality? Because there's a price to pay for everything. And I'll give you just a quick example for myself. So I, you know, I've been slowly, you know, sort of building up my uh, land uh, coaching empire. (laughs) Yeah. So I've always been a land investor and that's always been, you know, it's been great. And, you know, we scaled that up like, oh, if I can scale that up, why don't I just scale up my land coaching business so I can have bigger impact? I can help more people. And so once I started doing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a price to be paid for this. I had this great lifestyle. And now 
I'm in more meetings. I'm, I'm working harder than I've ever had to. And it's all for a wonderful purpose, but I'm, I'm paying the price for uh, this purpose in what was before working when I want, where I want, with whom I want. Now I'm, I'm doing things that I don't necessarily uh, love doing, but that are serving this purpose. And so there comes a point, I think, in everyone's intentionality where you hit that, that pivotal point where it's like, do I push or do I pivot? And from a business standpoint, I, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who try to grow their businesses. They realize, oh, wait, this is really hard. And then they, they don't like it and they go back to being small. And, and so what they had to do was push through that wall. Where I've seen other entrepreneurs, they just don't have a good product market fit. And it's you can push and push and push. It doesn't matter. You have to pivot. And so hey, do you have anything, if you had any experience like that where you've had to push, you had to pivot while you're creating your lifestyle design, like, wait a second, there's some miswanting here. And I had to either push through it to get what I wanted or I had to pivot. Yeah. So, you know, you, you talked about the price and how there's always a price. And to me, the, the price almost always comes down to discomfort in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you, you mentioned that you are working harder than you ever have before in, in service of trying to achieve some of those, those goals of, of growth and serving more people. And you can, you, I have zero doubt that you can get to a point where you are working the amount of hours that you want to be working every week and doing the the highest value, but also highest fun tasks that you want to be doing. But that requires a lot of uh, discomfort to put really good systems in place uh, and and good employees in place as well. You know, a combination of automations and streamlining and and uh, delegating to employees that takes a ton of work and it's really uncomfortable. There's there's a book that I've read recently uh, on, about this very topic called The Replaceable Founder by Ari Mizell, uh, which oh, I sure. highly recommend. I, I've had Ari on the show and I've been on his show. Oh, so you know Ari yeah. really well? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Less less doing more living. Great book yes. as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so you you know the the kind of premise behind that, uh, but it's uncomfortable. You know, putting yeah. making yourself replaceable in your own business is quite uncomfortable, and it takes a ton of work to get there. You can do it. Um, you know, you can have that that four hour work week. You know, <laughs> uh, Timothy Ferris kind of kind of life with a business that do, achieves all the things you want it to achieve, but it's it's no trivial feat to get your business that automated, that streamlined and you know put people in place that you trust that much. Um, so uh, yeah, to me, it comes down to the, the price is usually hard work and discomfort uh, to get there. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's talk a little bit about being an expat. Why did you become an expat and what are the benefits to you? So I have always had some wanderlust. Um, you know, I've always loved travel. There was a time in my 20s, I was dating a woman who was a travel nurse. And, and this was actually in 2008. So I, I lost my, my day job and all my investments hit the fan uh, <laughs> because of I was working for a hard money lender. And all of a sudden, no one's doing hard money loans, right? In 2008. Anyway, so I mean, I, I had no idea what I was going to do with myself. And she said, hey, I need to hit the road again for travel nursing. Do you want to come with me? And I said, "Well, I don't have anything else going here, <laughs> so you know, I'm kind of, you know, my my investment properties are in the toilet, and you know, I don't know what I'm doing for work. So why not? Yeah, I'll do it. Let's go." Uh, so we spent two years traveling around the country together, and that's that was my first introduction to actually working full time uh, remotely. I ended up getting a job um, telecommuting uh, back in 2008. You know, long before it was cool, right? Before the cool kids were doing it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I loved it. I loved that nomadic lifestyle. You know, we were spending three months at a time here and there. Uh, anyway, she and I broke up, of course. Um, you know, given that I called her my ex-girlfriend, uh, sure. my my wife, uh, who we were not married yet at at this time. You know, a couple of years later, we're dating, and she knew that I had some wanderlust, wanted to do more travel and, and particularly international travel. And my wife's in education. And she reached out to a mutual acquaintance of ours who worked for international schools and said, Hey, like, how does that work? You know, I, I think 
my my fiance would be interested in in living overseas for a little while, doing some more travel. And and this was all unbeknownst to me. She didn't tell me any of this. Uh, but so she signed up for a recruiting service for international schools and then hit me up as a surprise and said, hey, Brian, want to go to Boston in a few weeks for an international job fair? And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, and you know, I was still working for the the online business at that come that point. Um, so I could work from anywhere. And I said, sure, why not? Let's, let's go see what happens. And, you know, within a day, within 24 hours of us being at this conference, she had a bunch of job offers from all over the world. And she, uh, the one that, that looked most appealing to us was in Abu Dhabi, uh, the capital of the UAE. And we kind of looked at each other and we were like, screw it. Let's go. <laughs> why not? Let's go have an adventure. And we thought that we were going to go for two years because it's a, it was a two-year contract. And that was nine years ago and, and we're still overseas. So uh, yeah, it, it's been a fun adventure. I mean, we our home where we lived, we ended up renting it out with all of our furniture in it. We rented it as a furnished home. Uh, later ended up selling it uh, because we didn't come home. We, you know, we thought we were just going to move right back into that house. But um, yeah, so we spent four years in Abu Dhabi, uh, moved to Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, uh, spent four years there. We're currently in Lima, Peru. And we will be here for at least one more year. We might move back to the States for a little while uh, after this, just to reconnect with family. You know, our parents are getting older, sure. but it's it's been a fun adventure. And there are a ton of benefits beyond the obvious uh, of, of the expat life and living overseas. Yeah. Um, t- tell me some of those benefits. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, obviously we, we get a lot of great international travel. I mean, there was a time when we were averaging like 10 countries a year that we were visiting. Uh, it's slower today. We have a, a young daughter, but we still do quite a bit of international travel. Uh, and, you know, that's sort of the most obvious advantage. But beyond that, I mean, our daughter was born in Brazil. She's got dual citizenship. Uh, she has a, a Brazilian passport and a U.S. passport. Uh, she spoke Portuguese until we left Brazil. Uh, now she speaks Spanish. Uh, we're hoping that, you know, we're hoping she can pick the Portuguese back up at some point, given that she has citizenship for life in, in Brazil. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she goes to an international school surrounded by kids from all over the world. Uh, and it's an international baccalaureate school. You know, these, these schools where my wife works are some of the best schools in the world, U.S. embassy schools around the world. Um, so that's another benefit, you know, the, the amazing quality schools, which are often much more affordable or even free for, you know, depending on whether you work at the school or maybe you work at the embassy. Um, we don't have to pay the same U.S. taxes that you do. Uh, we can take advantage of the foreign earned income exclusion, which basically puts our first, I think it's around 115 grand per person a year right now. You know, it changes every year, of course, but uh, right. yeah, the first 115 grand or so a year that we each earn, you know, both my wife and, and I, uh, that's tax-free uh, living overseas. Uh, after above that, you know, we, we have to pay, but, uh, and there are some other types of taxes, which we have to base off employment taxes, but regular income taxes, our first 230 grand or so as a household, tax-free. Uh, so that's, do you have to pay taxes in Peru or? Um, my my wife does pay some taxes in Peru. Um, I don't file a tax return here. Uh, hopefully, the Peruvian authorities will not come <laughs> knock on my door now. You know, listening to this episode. Well, of um, course, they're listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. I mean, what Peruvian? Of course, who want doesn't? To? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was the same thing in Brazil. Technically, I was supposed to file a tax return in Brazil. I just didn't. Um, you know, it's not like I was earning income in Brazil anyway. Um, you know, right. my my income is based in the U.S. So, um, and then the UAE actually doesn't charge income taxes at all. It's one of the few countries in the world that doesn't charge income taxes. I think that's still true. When we were there, that was true, and I think that's still the case. Um, so, yeah, you and. If you do pay taxes in one country, you can usually um, offset those in in the other country. So you're not you're not getting double taxation. Uh, you you yeah. file at least I know that's true in the U.S. If you if you pay a certain amount of taxes in one country, they're not going to tax you on that amount in the U.S. Is my understanding. I'm not an accountant, of course, so you know talk, talk to your CPA about that. But um, so anyway, that's that's one more advantage is the foreign earned income exclusion and lower taxes. We also take advantage of geo arbitrage. I get paid in US dollars. I, actually, my wife gets paid in US dollars too at, at the US embassy school here. But we are living in Peruvian soles. And before that, in Brazilian hay ice. And before that, in Emirati durhams. 
Uh, and it's it's a lower cost of living in most places around the world than in the US. So I get paid in dollars, spend money in soles. Um, we we have a, a furnished apartment that we don't have to pay for because Katie's job covers it for us. But if we did have to pay for it, the rent is 1300 bucks a month for an apartment with an 180 degree view of the Pacific Ocean. I mean, wow. it is, it's a, I mean, it's a multi-million dollar view that we have in an admittedly, you know, totally mediocre apartment. I mean, it's not like a fancy apartment or anything, but it has a really fancy view, a view that I will never have again in my life. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, you couldn't get any, you couldn't get anywhere near the beach uh, in the U.S. for thirteen hundred dollars a month rent, right? Yeah, yeah. So especially in a major city, Lima has something like I don't know, twelve or thirteen million people living here. It's comparable to New York or L.A. So uh, yeah, we we live in a major city with still has relatively low cost of living compared to the U S uh, some of the best restaurants in the world are here in Lima. you go to the 50 best restaurant lists. There are like five or six on that list right here in Lima. It's nuts. So anyway, point being geo arbitrage, you can live a, a much higher quality of life in another country, especially if you are being paid in U S dollars. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've, uh, had friends who lived in Bali. I've had friends who are Australians live in Bali and they're taking, they're loving the geo arbitrage life and they've got a housekeeper and they've got massages and they eat amazing food. And it's for like a fraction of the cost and, uh, than, than you can have in the U S. So absolutely. are there any downsides or do you, see, do you see any, any negatives to it? What's yeah, there are there are a couple of downsides. Uh, one is just distance from family and friends. Uh, sure. You know, and of course, you make friends overseas. You make friends with expats and sometimes with locals, uh, but you do have to live far away uh, in another yeah. country, probably another continent, uh, when you live abroad, uh, and that's that's hard. We do we try to come home for you know six to eight weeks of the year, so we do spend a solid amount of time in the U.S. You know. With, with family every year, uh, but still, but we're not there. You know, it's not like I can drop by my dad's house for dinner on a Wednesday night. Uh, and that's, that's hard. We've missed a lot of weddings. We've missed funerals. We've missed the birth of children. <laughs> you know, like, you know, my, my nephews, uh, I wasn't there when they were born. Uh, that's a huge downside, just being so far away from, from family and, and other loved ones. Uh, you know, increasingly, you know, from a, a business and pers uh, professional side, it's become increasingly clear to me that uh, you know it has stunted my professional growth a little bit not attending some of the big conferences in the US um you know that is it's become a priority for me over the course of the next 12 months to to actually start to make that effort to fly back to the US uh you know even yeah. though it's going to be expensive and it's going to be you know really inconvenient and time consuming to fly uh, you know the travel time to get to and from it's that's going to be hard and it's still probably worth it. I mean, I, you know, for years I've been avoiding attending U S conferences and I think that has had a negative impact on my, my personal growth, uh, and on our business's growth. So uh, yeah, there are downsides, you know, like to, to return to your theme from earlier, there's always a price, right? There's always a price. Yeah, absolutely. So with the, the time we have left, you know, how does passive investing in spark rental help me take advantage of those four freedoms of lifestyle design. Yeah. So I, I cut my teeth in real estate as a rental investor, you know, going out and doing bird deals for the most part, which is really labor intensive. <laughs> right. uh, it's they're labor intensive to find the deals, to renovate the properties, to manage the properties afterwards. And even if you hire a property manager, you have to manage the manager. And it's just, it's a lot of work. It's not truly passive income and it's certainly not passive investing. I got rid of all those properties because I hated being a landlord and it was all just too much work. So now I invest totally passively. Uh, I invest in real estate syndications and in notes and other types of passive investments. Uh, and if anyone's not familiar with the term real estate syndication, it's not an intimidating term. These are just big real estate deals where the a professional investor buys it and then raises some of the money from passive investors like you and me, who basically become silent partners. Uh, what are called limited partners or LPs in these deals. Uh, right. So you know, we become fractional owners in these big apartment complexes or land deals or mobile home parks or whatever type of property it is. And it's a, it's a hands-off way to invest, but you still get all the benefits of real estate investing. You still get the cash flow, you still get the appreciation, you still get the full tax benefits. 
So you get all the all the pros of owning real estate without having to become a landlord. So that's sort of the the big picture. And as far as what we do at Spark Rental, we try to make the the two biggest barriers to entry for real estate syndications uh, go away. We, we try to surmount those two barriers to entry for people. And those two barriers to entry are one, the high minimum investment, typically 50 to 100 grand to invest in these deals, which is not chump change, right? And it's really hard to diversify if you have to plug that much money into a single deal. Uh, so we go in on these deals together as an investment club where each person can invest five grand if they want or more. Uh, you know, whatever they want uh, above five grand. And then collectively we're investing, you know, 200, 300 grand, whatever it is in that deal. So we're well above the minimum investment. Uh, and then the other barrier to entry is deal flow. And in particular, finding sponsors and finding deals that allow non-accredited investors because most real estate syndications, uh, or at least many real estate syndications only allow non, or I'm sorry, only allow accredited investors to participate. Uh, and if again, if that's a term that you're not familiar with, these are wealthy investors mean to have at least a million dollar net worth, not including equity in your home, or you have to have earned 200 grand or more uh, over the last couple of years, uh, 300 grand if you're a married couple. So, you know, better off people, uh, wealthier investors. Uh, and the, Non-accredited investors do have access to some of these deals. And in fact, in our club, we only look at deals that allow non-accredited investors to keep it open for everybody. Uh, but syndicators, also known as sponsors, they by law are not allowed to publicly advertise deals that are open to non-accredited investors. So then you have a catch-22 where if you're a non-accredited investor, how are you supposed to find sponsors or deals to invest in when they can't advertise to you? They can't reach out to you. Right. So that is the other barrier to entry that we aim to solve for in our club. Denny and I, my partner and I, spend half of our time networking with syndicators and with sponsors. Uh, and we, we bring them in uh, to our club. We meet twice a month. Uh, sponsors will present their deals or we'll have uh, just educational presentations. Uh, and again, it's it's a really easy, low stress, low dollar amount way to invest passively in real estate, get all those benefits without becoming a landlord. I love it. I love it. Well, Brian, this has been a, a fantastic podcast. Your mentorship has been fantastic. But well, now we're at that point in the podcast I'm going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the auto passing income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. But before you give that, just have to give a shout out to our sponsor, which is Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can transform your life. Go up that mountain of land investing quickly, safely, and efficiently with, uh, with our team. And you're going to start creating that passive income without any renters, rehabs, renovations or roads. I know you're thinking, what about the tuition? Ain't going to cost you nothing. Guaranteed, you're going to make back that money 180 days or less. Just show us your work. Learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training. All right, Brian, what is your tip of the week? So I'll give, I'll give two very quick ones, one specific and one broader. The specific one, I recently loved the book, The Gap and the Gain by Dan Sullivan. And I, I think it was Ben Hardy, ben Hardy. Was the other author. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great book. Highly recommend it. Um, more broadly, listen to audiobooks. You know, Join Audible. And while you're working out every day or while you're cooking dinner or while you're commuting, listen to books. <laughs> Fiction, yeah. nonfiction, personal development, business books, investing books, you know, crime novels, fantasy, science fiction, you know, historical fiction, whatever. I mean, I go through probably 50 books a year and three quarters of those are Listen, audiobooks that I listen to while I'm working out or doing other things. And I would never be able to go through that many books if I were only relying on reading on my Kindle. So uh, join Audible, listen to audiobooks, you know, make your life better. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love it. I mean, and the way I read, because I have the attention span of a ferret on double cappuccino, is I'll get the audiobook and the book and go. I'll listen on, you know, 1.75 or 2x speed while I'm reading and then I'm totally, you know, locked in. So that, that kind of helps. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about Brian and group investing at sparkrental.com. Sparkrental.com. We'll have a, a link in the show notes. Uh, if you're getting value from this podcast, do us a favor, follow, rate, review the podcast. Send a screenshot of that review. Support at thelandgeek.com. I'm going to send you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. But just do it selfishly anyways because we get better guests 
because they see all those wonderful ratings. They're like, oh, this is a big deal. I'll go and talk to Mark. All right. Thanks, everybody. Brian, are we good? We're great. Mark, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks again. Let freedom ring. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.